Good morning, guys. Welcome to North Coast Family Fellowship. How are you guys doing today? That didn't sound exciting enough. Can we do that again? How are you this morning? There it is. There it is. Guys, we are so excited to be here to worship God together. And thank you for joining us either in person or online. For those of you online, welcome this morning. Uh, we are here to love Jesus, love others, and love others to Jesus. And one of the ways that we like to do that is through actually building relationships with each other. And one of the tools we use is this thing called our Connect Card. It can be found in your bulletin or online at www.ncffchurch.org forward slash connect. Uh, we ask that everyone, whether you're attending in person or online, to fill out our Connect card. And this is one of the ways that we can get in touch with you guys to let you know what our ministries are and what we're, what we're all about here. Um, there's also a place where you could fill out a prayer request. And I got to tell you, we have an amazing team of people who pray for you guys every week. And so that prayer request is really important. Fill those out. Um, it also just helps us better connect with you like in our individual ministries. And if you want to learn more about what we do in students or young adults or small groups, that's a wonderful place to just fill out. I want to know more about this. And so we ask, fill that out, drop it in the offering bucket, or just hit submit online. Uh, the other thing that you can sign up for on our, our, in our Connect card is our thing called our weekly e-blast. This is a weekly email that we send out every single Saturday that gets you guys prepared for what to expect on a Sunday morning and the coming weeks. And I gotta say, most of the time, Pastor John writes these, but they're written by um, our pastors here on staff. And it's just a really good way to stay up to date with what we're doing every week. And you could fill out, or you could sign up for it by filling out your Connect card and saying, I wanna be on our weekly e-blast and we'll get you signed up. Uh, speaking of which, uh, this is also the last Sunday of July, which is insane. I actually was thinking about that. My birthday was on Friday, and I was like, wow, July's over. But thank you. I probably shouldn't have said that, actually. <laughs> um, but because it's the last Sunday, it's my time to remind you all that next week, it's time to turn in your blue bags. Now these are bags filled with food donated by you guys. So you take a bag in our lobby, fill it up with food, bring it here next week and drop it off. And they, this food goes to the South County Food Bank that serves so many families in our community. And we're a huge contributor to them and they are, they are a blessing to our community. And we love partnering with ministries like the South County Food Bank to help serve our community. And so if you have not done so yet, Take a blue bag, fill it up with food, bring it back here next week, and that's when we drop them off. Now, our final thing, because we are going into worship right now, and I'm really excited to worship with all of you this morning, but we love to worship here as a church, and occasionally we love to do it more and more and more, and we love to provide opportunities to, to help us just get into more worship here, and every once in a while we do a night of worship. And so on August 6th, we're going to do a night of worship and praise. Pastor Paul is putting, organizing it, putting it all together. Um, it's going to be a night where we come, we worship, we pray, and we connect with God and with each other. And we're excited to worship. But this morning, we are also really excited to be here and to worship. That is why we come. We gather to be the body to connect together and to worship. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Paul. Yes, thank you, Pastor Brandon. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about uh, Praise and Worship Night. It'll be a lot of fun uh, being joining together and taking time out of our, our week, uh, more than just on Sunday morning, to worship together, praise together, and also to pray together as well, which will be a lot of fun. So I hope you guys make it. It'll be a lot of fun to see you all there. Uh, this morning, I'm really excited because Pastor John is gonna be starting a new series that uh, he has coined as Postcards from Paradise. Ooh, ooh, sounds like fun. Uh, but it's, it's uh, because we're gonna be going through the book of 2 John uh, starting today, and really it's a small enough book that you could print it on a postcard. 
uh, we're actually going to read it together before the sermon starts today, and it's like a two-minute video. Isn't that crazy? But there's so much truth and love packed into that uh, small little book, and we're going to be talking about that. And one of the big things, the big themes of this book is uh, seeking after biblical truth and biblical love uh, that comes from God. And so this morning, I want to start off our time. Let's all stand up together. We're going to sing a song called Your Love Never Fails, and it's just about the assurance that we have. We know, we know that God's love is always there. He's never changing, and we can always count on him. So let's sing this one this morning. You guys ready to praise? Amen.
Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen. Let's give him a shout of praise this morning. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of the sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.
Well, North Coast, thank you so much once again for joining us here this morning. Uh, this is such a joy and a blessing to be able to worship together here in, in this building and uh, just with all of you here and online as well. Uh, it's just such an encouraging time. I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for me, but it's such an encouraging time just to be worshiping together and, and seeing your smiling faces in the morning. That's a wonderful thing. Well, we're going to enter into our time of offering right now. And, uh, and during the offering time, we're going to be playing a song. Uh, one of, there's, there's some rare songs in, uh, in Christian history where not only do congregations not get tired of singing it, but worship leaders also don't get tired of singing it. And uh, there are some like that. I just, I'm so sorry, but... But this is one of them. I just, I just love this song so much. It's called The Stand, and it's just, it's so foundational to just uh, how we want to worship the Lord. It's just, just standing here abandoned to Him and just wanting to humble ourselves before the Lord and just give Him all the praise that He deserves. And if that's in a song, it's worth singing to me. And so this morning, especially as we go into the offering time and continue in our worship to the Lord this morning. Uh, Let's really abandon ourselves to the Lord and just be ready to give ourselves up for him. Now, whatever is getting in the way of that, whatever happens uh, in between these weeks that we have together, don't let that get in the way of the amazing plans that God has for you and all the love that he has for you as well. So let's sing this one together this morning and uh, after you pray with me. <laughs> God, I just thank you for this morning, this chance that we have, uh, just this other, another chance that we have, God, to give our lives over to you. We can trust you. We can trust your plan for our lives that uh, you want what's best for us. And what's best for us is to find our identity in you, to worship you, to praise you, and follow uh, in the plan that you have laid out for us. Pray this morning that we can just be really open to what that may be. Uh, maybe just reveal a little bit more of your plan to us this morning, God, that uh, just knowing what you want from us, knowing what direction you want to take us in, God. Uh, you have those plans. You know what's in the future, God. I just pray that you can put our minds at ease today, that we can worship you uh, with just reckless abandon this morning, God. We all these things in your name. Amen. You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before my faith Yeah. 
songs and praise you, God, that uh, all of it would just point back to you and your glory today. Uh, you are the center of everything that we need to be doing, the center of our lives, God. And I just pray that we can redirect our focus to you here today. I pray as we open your word together this morning that uh, we can just really feel the weight of the words that you have for us. Even just a few words, God, of this book, uh, just, it can change the course of of our lives, God. And I just pray that we can be open to that. We can be open to your word, your living word this morning. What it has for us is so much bigger and so much more important than anything else in our lives, God. I just pray that we can use that um, to direct uh, our focus, direct our attention, and really love each other well, God. I pray we can learn more about your truth and your love here today and where that comes from, and that comes straight from you, God. In a world that seems so lost in what truth and what love is, I pray that you can redirect us and show us exactly what that is, God. I pray this morning as Pastor John comes up to preach, you can just give him a mighty word for us today, that you can just speak right through him, uh, just fill him with the Holy Spirit here today, and uh, just deliver a mighty word that we need to hear today. And just I pray that we can be open to what that word has for us, God. I pray we can be good hearers and doers of your word as well. I pray all these things in your wonderful name. Amen. Uh, Sunday schoolers, please do not sit down. Please stand up. You are dismissed off to your class. Have a fun time. I'll see you up there in just a minute. Uh, we have a short little video for you right now. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Joe. He's here on staff with us. Uh, he's awesome. If you ask him what he does, uh, his answer is everything. So uh, anyways, uh, he's going to be reading our, our scripture for today. So take a look. Hey, North Coast. I'm out here in nature in the most beautiful place, and uh, I've got a question for you. Have you ever gone on vacation to someplace extremely beautiful and you saw something magical that you wanted to share with your family or your friends? So you found a, a gift shop and bought a postcard, and then you wrote out the address and you sent it to your loved one. Well, that's kind of what John is doing in 2nd and 3rd John. And we're diving into a series um, that we've entitled Postcards from Paradise. And today I'm going to read to you the book of 2 John. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. Not only I, but also all who know the truth. For the sake of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of you children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. And now I ask you, lady, not as one writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we've had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this love is that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, just as the deceiver will end the Antichrist. Watch yourselves, that you might not lose what we've accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching do not receive him into your house, and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. Let me pray for you. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing day, for, for your word, um, that we get to soak it in, Lord, and, and be a part of it. Lord, I pray for John that you would give him words to say, Lord, that we need to hear to impact our hearts and minds to draw closer to you, Lord. We commit this time to you, and we just love you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody, on sight and on light. It's great to have you here. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and go all the way to the back, okay? And you'll find this little book called The Second Letter of John. So go ahead and find that, if you would, and we're going to study this together for the next couple of weeks, and then, Lord willing, we'll go into Third John, and then we'll be out of summer at that point, and then, uh, God willing, we're going to start the book of Esther uh, sometime in September. So really, I'm looking ahead to just being able to share God's truth with you, and today, we we want to talk. Uh, the tr- we want to talk about the truth about love. And so, if you open up the note or the program that you got when you came in, or that it's online, therefore you can download it. I want to read that opening paragraph to you, just to kind of help orient all of us to what God is saying to us here in Second John, verses one to tr- one to three. So, guys, two thousand years ago, Jesus Christ, who uh, was and is God in human flesh made this incredibly bold claim. He said, I am the truth. Now, you got to use your imagination on this, okay? He's talking to his disciples. He's looking straight at them, and he says, you want to know what truth is? You want to know what absolute truth is all about? And he's saying, look at me, because, man, I am the truth of God in living flesh, now, sometimes we read Scripture, and we just kind of pass over these things, but you've got to realize when Jesus said those words to the disciples, man, that was pretty startling. Just like if I walked up to you today, got nose to nose with you, and said, look, man, I'm telling you, I am the truth of God. I mean, you'd either fall at my feet and worship me, or you would call the police to drag me away, one or the other, right? Because it wouldn't be true of me, but it was of Jesus. And so he's talking to his followers, and he says, look at me me, I am the truth. And then, just a few days later, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, he served under the emperor Tiberius, he scoffed at our Lord, and he countered what Christ had said with these words of his own, hey, what is truth? What do you think truth is, Mr. Jesus? Though phrased as a question, In reality, it was a cynical statement revealing what Pilate actually believed about truth. Um, Jesus taught that absolute truth is an objective reality and could be found in him alone. Pilate, on the other hand, said that absolute truth is nothing but an illusion. It is nowhere to be found. And ever since that time, The church has been in conflict with, we'll call it Pilate's world, regarding the nature and the origin of truth. And so today, what we've ended up with is this postmodern culture that is teaching your kids and that is teaching your grandkids and any other children that you know for that matter that there is no such thing as objective or absolute truth. Wow. If it even exists at all, that is. So Second John was written, realize this, out of love for fallen humanity to save us from our own foolishness by letting us know that eternal truth is indeed knowable, that it is definitely discoverable in the person of Jesus. And the blessing is this, discovering the truth of God is the way that everyone can then experience the love of God. In fact, listen, beloved, it is the only way. The only way to fully experience the love of God is to have an encounter that changes your life and that is constantly transforming your life with the truth of God. In fact, it's the only way. Second John, uh, this postcard from paradise written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see as we study through it, it will show you and me how we can have both God's truth and God's love guiding us, inspiring us on a daily basis, and also transforming our lives such that people are going to see Christ in us 
and they're going to want to have the love of God, the truth of God. They're going to want to have Jesus for themselves. So let's have some fun this morning, and uh, let's get introduced to this little postcard book of 2 John, okay? So the first thing I want to talk to you about is who wrote it? <clears throat> Let me give you a, well, I'm going to give you an opportunity here. Who do you think wrote 2 John? All right, good job. It's kind of like who's buried in Grant's tomb, right? So who wrote it? It was the Apostle John. He's the last living of the original 12 disciples. But there's some things we got to know about John. When he wrote this book, John was close to 100 years old. Wow, we have a lady in our church, Edith. She is 98.5 years old. I know that because she volunteered in vacation Bible school last week. And for those of us that are younger, I want you to notice it did not kill Edith off, okay? So next year when we're looking for volunteers, you can join with Edith, okay? 98 and a half years old. She's worshiping God. She loves the Lord. And that's how John is. He pens these three epistles of John, 1st John, which we studied earlier this year, 2nd and 3rd John, and he refers to himself in verse 1, there's only one chapter uh, of 2nd John, he refers to himself as the elder, the elder. Now he does that because he wants to identify himself as being an elder or having the position of elder or pastor in the church. And he wants his readers to know that by God's grace, he is a, a wisdom-filled spiritual leader. So he uses the word elder to talk about his spiritual position and wisdom. But he also uses the word elder here as opposed to apostle um, he uses the word elder because he wants people to be aware of his advanced age as a human being. And so this little phrase, the elder, uh, it captures who John is, a man chock full of godly wisdom from Jesus Christ who has had a hundred years of life to take in the truth of God, the love of God, and to walk as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, the epistles of John uh, are uh, some of the last books. They are the last books of the Bible to be written. Uh, second, and, second and third John are the shortest books in the Bible, less than 300 words each. You can read them about two minutes or less, which is why I'm referring to this summer's teaching uh, series uh, through 2nd and 3rd John as Postcards from Paradise because they're really short. I mean, they're really dinky, uh, and they're from heaven, and they are God's truth and God's love to us from heaven. So that's a little bit of the background on the Apostle John. But then the next question I want to talk to you about is to whom was it written? Who did he have in mind when he wrote these words, okay? Well, John tells us who he wrote to, sort of, uh, in verse 1. Let's take a look at it. It says, elder, the elder rather, that's the Apostle John, to, I'm writing to the chosen lady. You might want to circle that if you're a note taker, the chosen lady and her children. And the question is, who is this chosen lady that John is referring to here? Who's the chosen lady? Well, there's, there's two possibilities. One, and this is kind of a cool one, is that John was referring to a very specific individual, a very specific woman, okay? And in this case, this would be a lady that John knew personally, and again, the question is, well, who, who was she? And what I want you to do in order to try to figure out who this lady might have been, I want you to go to the last verse of 2 John. It's verse 13, okay? And look at it with me. As John wraps up this postcard from paradise, he says to the chosen lady, he says, chosen lady, the children of your chosen sister greet you. Chosen lady, chosen sister two individuals here, okay? A sister combo. Many believe that this sister combo is a reference to Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead in John chapter 11. And why did they, why did they believe that? And that, that would mean that these two gals, man, they were old like John, okay? So why do people believe that? Well, our English word lady is from the Greek term kyria, 
which interestingly, in the Aramaic language, is pronounced Marta, or we'd say Martha. Martha means chosen lady. And so for that reason, a lot of scholars believe that John was actually addressing Martha, and he was saying, by the way, Martha, your sis, Mary, is greeting you. That's a possibility. There's a second possibility as to who this uh, book was written to, this epistle, and that is to a very specific church, a singular specific church. And now, in that case, if, if that's if that's what he's trying to communicate, then John is using a feminine designation, chosen lady, to address uh, an individual church, the name of which he does not mention specifically. And, you know, the Bible does that often. It refers to the church as the bride of Christ, and that's very possibly what the Apostle John is doing here. So if that's the case, then in this uh, section of Scripture, Verse 1, chosen lady, that would be a, a church that John was writing to. We don't know the specific name of that church. And chosen sister, in verse 13, would be the church where John served as an elder, as a pastor. And we know from history that John served as a pastor in the church of Ephesus. And so he would have been writing from modern-day Turkey to some unknown church, known then to them, but not necessarily today to us. Uh, my heart wants to believe that it's Mary and Martha. My head tells me it's probably more John writing to a specific church. Well, when was it written? It was written around 90 to 95 A.D. How many of you remember those days? Were you here then? Raise your hand. Okay. A couple of you. Okay. Um, well, the historical setting of 90 to 95 A.D. for believers uh, held some very significant things. There were significant things going on. First of all, persecution, guys, was breaking out all around the empire, persecution of Christians. And so Christians were losing their homes. Christians were losing their families. Christians were losing their jobs. Christians were losing their lives because they were choosing to be followers of Jesus Christ and they were choosing to be faithful to him as their savior, their God, and their Lord. And one of the reasons that John did not mention either that specific woman or that specific church, he did not want to risk identifying that church or that lady because that would have undoubtedly unleashed persecution upon their heads. And so he's, he's kind of writing in code. I mean, he knew who he was writing to. The church who received his letter knew that it was John writing to them. He wasn't afraid of persecution because at this point, they had already tried to kill John in so many times and in so many ways that they had just given up. But he wanted to protect that woman or that church, and so he doesn't give a designation for us today. So persecution is breaking out everywhere. The other thing you need to know about the historical setting is that phony preachers and false teachers were spreading like wildfire in the church in these early days. And they were teaching lies and perversions very specifically about the nature of truth and lies and perversions very specifically about the nature of what love truly is. And beloved, listen, listen now. That same problem that existed back then exists in our world today. And tragically, tragically in so many of our churches today. Believers are confused, just as worldlings are, about what truth is, and too many of us as followers of Christ, we are messed up in our understanding of what love actually is. And so this is why God had John pen this postcard from paradise so that he could talk to us about the biblical nature of God's truth and God's love. So then, why was it written? Well, I guess I've kind of given that away. The word truth shows up five times in these 
in this short book in only 13 verses, the word love shows up four times in 2 John. And so we, we saw when we went through 1 John earlier this year that John was known as the apostle of love because he talked about love over and over and over again. But here in 2 John, we're going to see that he was also known as the apostle of truth, the apostle of truth because he taught both. And listen, guys, as the apostle of love and as the apostle of truth, the Holy Spirit had John write Second John to teach what God's truth and love are, to clearly teach what God's truth and love are, and to show how God's truth and love are, listen now, are inseparably linked, inseparably linked. The fact is, love cannot exist apart from truth, and truth cannot exist apart from love. And one man put it this way, our love grows soft when it is not strengthened by truth, and our truth grows harsh when it is not given in love. Let me repeat that to you. It's very, very important to understand this. Our love grows soft, grows mushy when it is not strengthened by the truth of God. And our truth, well, it'll become harsh uh, when it is not spoken in love. Have you ever had somebody tell you the truth by just venting all over you with not a whole lot of love? I mean, it, it hurts. I mean, the truth is being used to pound you over the head. Have you ever had somebody say, you know, I just love them too much. I I don't want to tell them that, that, you know, if they keep driving, they're going to drive right over the cliff. I mean, you've had people do that to you, maybe not literally, but figuratively, when there's things going on in your life or in mine that somebody who loved us should have spoken to us about, and they just said, you know, I love them too much. I don't want to rock their boat. And, And John just says, man... Man, that, that is wrong. you got to have both. And so here, in these opening verses of 2 John, the apostle tells us four things about God's love and God's truth, these, these two inseparable qualities. And the first one is this. Jot it down. God's love and God's truth are, in, are best appreciated They are best appreciated through the lens of spiritual maturity. If you're going to understand what God's love is, if you are going to fathom what truth actually is, God's truth is, then then the only way that you're going to be able to pull that off is that you are, if you are seeking the Holy Spirit to give you spiritual maturity and understanding from the Word of God. Again, John identifies himself in verse 1 as the elder, which means this guy had been around a long time. John had had a ton of experiences. He had seen a lot of places. He had done a lot of things. Understand, beloved, that this man, the Apostle John, he was off the charts godly. (laughs) He was also older than the hills, right? And the truth is, he was at the end of his life. And John didn't know on a day-by-day basis whether he'd be around for the next day or if the next day would be when he would be called by God to leave this earth and go to heaven. And so you have this man who at 100 years old is saying, God's calling me to write the closing words of the Bible, and these are the closing words of my own life. What John is giving to us in his epistles is what we would call legacy. This is legacy stuff that he's imparting to you and me as followers of Jesus. And look at what this guy talks about. He's at the end of his life, and he's saying, guys, listen up. Listen up, man. Before I kick off, there's two things I got to tell you about before I can leave this planet. One is truth. The other is love. There's an intensity to John here. He wants us to hear and understand that nothing in life matters more 
than us grasping God's truth and God's love. Nothing you will do, ever do in this lifetime, or for that matter in eternity, matters more than grasping and living by the truth of God and the love of God. And the Apostle John is desperate at 100 years old or so that we realize this, that we grasp it, and that we believe this. You know, uh, tragically, our world is thinking in a crazy way, which should be of no surprise. But sadly, the same is true in the lives and in the thinking process of many believers. This is why we need to be studying 2 John. Let me give you two crazy truths that are shaping this world and and shaping the thinking of way too many Christians. The first crazy truth is this. Hey, love matters more than the truth. Love matters more than the truth. Man, I love you so much, and that matters matters more than anything else. Um... (laughs) That is a lie. Heard one guy describe this as sloppy agape, and I think he was right, (laughs) okay? You can't have love unless you have truth. And then the other crazy thought is, well, you know, truth is what we make it. Do you hear the Twilight Zone music playing in the background? (laughs) Truth is what we make it. In other words, it's ambiguous. My friend, you create your own truth. You create your own reality. Don't you understand that? And we decide what is right. No one else decides that for us or what is wrong. No one else decides that for us. God, if he exists, he doesn't decide that for us. Listen. What John is trying to tell us is this. God's truth sets the boundaries of love. Jot that down. God's truth sets the boundaries for love. This is true in life and in the lifestyle that you choose. This is true in terms of the origin of life. This is true in terms of the preciousness and the sanctity of life. It is God's truth that sets the boundaries of what is the loving thing to do in life and toward life. It is God's truth that sets the boundaries for what marital love looks like, both before you're married and then once you are married. We don't, these are not questions that we try to figure out for ourselves in terms of our behavior before marriage or within marriage. That truth has been given to us, and when we follow that truth, then we are better able to love with the love of God, the spouse that God has given to us. This is true of gender and gender identity, that this is not for us to figure out or try to create our own reality or or mess around with. But God says in the beginning, God created Mankind, male and female. That's what the truth of God, the absolute truth of God, has to say. God defines for us true spirituality. And it's not new age. It's not all the different philosophies and religions of the world. True spirituality is defined in one singular way, and that is the more you become like Jesus, the more truly spiritual you are. Simple as that. Simple as that. The more you become like Jesus, the more spiritual you are. And the world today wants to say that true spirituality is some kind of oozy feeling that you get. You can study all the philosophies and you can do all this kind of stuff. And hey, I'm not against studying other religions. I'm certainly not against studying philosophy. But if you want to know truth and judge the, tr- the reality, the, the truth or the falsehood of those philosophies, of those religions, then study the word of God. Study Jesus. And you will know the truth. Listen, 
John 8 and verse 32, scripture tells us this. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. How many of you love freedom? How many of you want more freedom in your life? You know, how many of you want, you know, we, we always think of freedom as it relates oftentimes to our country and thank God for that. But guys, freedom is freedom in your heart. Freedom is freedom of your thinking process. Freedom is the ability to say no to sin and to say yes to righteousness. And, and that's what happens when we know the truth of God. He will set us free with his truth. And beloved, listen now. We, as followers of Jesus, have to realize that God's truth sets the boundaries of love. It is crucial that you and I, in this room today, know this beyond a shadow of a doubt because of what Paul wrote under the inspiration of God in 1 Timothy 3.15. Take a look at it. The church of the living God, that includes us, is the pillar and is the support of the, what's the word, guys? truth. Listen, if you don't know the truth of God's word, if you don't know the absolutes of what God says, ain't no way the world is going to figure it out on its own. Listen, beloved, the only way this hateful and deceived world is going to convert to God's love and God's truth is if we as Christians present to them God's love and God's truth. And I would add this, we need to do it in humble confidence. Jot that phrase down, humble confidence. Sometimes we as Christians, uh, we kind of strut around like peacocks. Hey, we know the truth. You know, the truth is such free. And you're kind of an idiot for not knowing it. And so, idiot, non-Christian, you need to become a Christian like me so you can be as good as me. I would say that that is not humble confidence. I would say that that is arrogance. And um, no wonder nobody listens to your testimony. But if there's a humbleness about you, and you show people God's truth, and you show people God's love, and you pray for opportunities to speak about God's truth, and you pray for opportunities to speak about God's love, and when those opportunities show up, and you do it in a kind, and in a gracious, and in a humble way, and you share your own testimony, what a, a, a messed up scoundrel you were, <laughs> maybe still are, uh, but how God's truth has set you free, and how God's love has changed your life, and you just wish so badly for them to have that, and, you can, my friend, if you give your life to Jesus, who's God's truth and God's love embodied. It's best appreciated through the lens of spiritual maturity. It's also best shared in that way. The second thing about God's love and truth we gotta know is this. It unites God's family together. God's truth and God's love unites the family of God together. Take a look again at verse one. John says, you know, I love in truth, yet not only me, in other words, there's others who love in truth, but also all who know the truth, who realize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So honest truth and heartfelt love when we are trafficking in those things, honest truth and heartfelt love those things will bond believers together with a unity that is rock solid, that is rock solid. Honest truth and heartfelt love. A great example of this, Ephesians chapter four and verse 15, Paul writes these words, as we, and that's a reference to us, to you and to me, to us collectively, as we speak God's truth with his love from our hearts, then we, which means all of us, we're gonna grow up to be more and more like Jesus. That's the end goal, to be like Jesus. And so the more we speak truth to each other, humbly, though confidently, because we can have confidence because the truth is here, humbly and yet in love, 
then the more the Holy Spirit is free to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And so it, it, it's something that you gotta see through spiritual lenses. It's something that unites the family of God, which unfortunately in today's society, COVID has made it even worse, is splintering in so many ways. But when you have God's love and God's truth working together, it, it, it's, like, it's like a magnet that just draws you together. And then the third thing you gotta know about God's love and truth, John tells us is this, God's love and truth, well, it's, they have been strategically placed in every believer's life. God has placed his truth, God has placed his love in the lives of every single Christian. Take a look at verse two with me. We, Christians, love because the truth, the truth of God, it's inside of us. And I love this next phrase, and it will be with us forever. Now compare what John wrote here in 2 John 2 to what Jesus said in John chapters 15 and 16. Jesus said the spirit of truth which is a reference to the Holy Spirit, he will come to you from God the Father. And he will come, when he comes, he will testify all about me, Jesus said, and all about God's plans for the future. Wow. So the Holy Spirit, when you became a Christian, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, entered into your life. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans, if the Holy Spirit isn't in your life, man, then you're not a Christian. So if you're a Christian, the fact is the Holy Spirit is in your life. And when he entered your life upon your conversion to Christ, then the resources of God's love and the resources of God's truth came with the Spirit of God. And they are firmly planted within you and me. We have an endless supply of the truth of God and the love of God forever. Which means you can, you can effectively tell others in a humbly confident way about the truth of God. You can do that because the Holy Spirit empowers you. It means you can love others to faith in God because the Holy Spirit enables you. And I want you to capture this, guys. The Spirit of of love, God's Holy Spirit of love, God's Holy Spirit of truth, He is inside of you which means you have this irrepressible, unconquerable partner who does make it possible for you to speak the truth of God, who does make it possible for you to show the love of God. That that capacity is in you. And so pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Well, believe this first and then pray for the Holy Spirit to unleash these abilities from you that he has placed in you. Man, pray this with power and with strength and with belief. Lord God, use me effectively to share your truth. Lord God, use me effectively to spread your love. And if you believe that these things are within you, as scripture teaches, and then you pray that the Holy Spirit will unleash these things in you, through you. I'm telling you, God will answer that prayer. You wanna know how to pray the will of God? I've just given you two aspects of the will of God for your life. Hey, last thing about God's love and truth is this that John mentions in verse three. He says this, God's love and God's truth bless his children with the gifts that only God can give. When God's truth and God's love are just, you know, raging within us, running our lives, then it's a blessing to his children because it brings the sorts of gifts to us that only God can give and provide. Take a look at verse three, it's pretty amazing. 
grace and mercy and peace. Anybody here interested in some grace? Yeah. A few folks, maybe, is there anybody here that needs a little mercy today? Yeah. I mean, you're like, you like, need mercy. <laughs> how, many, how many of you need mercy? Why don't you just say it if you do, just say mercy. <laughs> okay, about half of you. The others of you need to wake up. <laughs> and then peace, wow. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from his son, Jesus Christ, as we live in his truth and in his love. As you take your schedule, your agenda for today, and you wrap it around the love and the truth of God. As you say, Jesus, help me to look past myself and whatever it is that's bugging me, whatever it is that's pulling me down, and instead lift me up and cause me to rejoice in the truth and in the love that you have poured into my life. God, use that to set my attitude, and then God, use that to explode my actions so that this day, as people meet me, they're gonna hear wonderful truth, and they're going to experience amazing love. That's God's will for us. And so what are these gifts of grace and mercy and peace? Well, guys, here's some simple definitions. Grace is God's abundant daily kindness. Grace is God's daily abundant kindness. Yesterday, Becky and I were wrapping up our day, we were praying, and we were thanking God for his grace. And I mean, lots of good things happened to us. You know, we were able to, we got an eight-month-old uh, golden retriever who's turned out to be a great dog. Um, Becky's training that dog, and she's still trying to train me. It's, it's going okay with the dog. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, then we had grace. We went up, we got some, we got some gas in our car. And then we went to Costco and, you know, we bought some stuff. And thank God in heaven for what? The snacks are back, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what Saturday on the coast of Oregon is all about for the locals, you know? We go to the beach on the other days. We go to Costco on Saturday. Bring those snacks, right? And then there's mercy, and that's God's complete daily salvation. You know, when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, he forgave you for all your past sins. He even forgave you for the sins that you're, you were committing that day. And he also committed, he, he forgave you for all the sins that you will commit in the future. That's amazing mercy. Um, but I love the fact that we can know every day that when we sin, the mercy of God is ours in abundance. He doesn't say, John, I am so sick and tired of you doing that same thing again to the woodshed for you for the rest of your life. It doesn't work that way. He's unbelievably merciful to us. The, the impact of salvation is not just the moment you gave your life to Christ, but it is every single moment of your life. You're experiencing the mercy of God at this moment. Have you thanked God for the fact that the screw-ups that we are in this moment will not separate us from the love of Almighty God? That's mercy. And then finally, there's peace. There's peace, and that's God's faithful, daily calm and comfort the common comfort that God will give to us on a daily basis as we walk with him in truth and in his love. So guys, let me give you some takeaways uh, as we wrap it up this morning. Let God's love and truth transform your thoughts of others. Let it transform your thoughts of others. When you see people, even those folks that irritate the daylights out of you, even the person that snuck ahead of you in the snack line at Costco, which some believe is the unforgivable sin in the New Testament. <laughs> Let the love and truth of God transform your thinking process towards others so that you're not as harsh, 
so that you're not as judgmental. So that is you're not so much needing to insist on my rights. Instead, you're truthful about the things that matter and you're loving in the ways of Jesus. How you think about others. You got anybody in your head right now that you're a little ticked off at? Might be a good idea to ask God to have his love and truth transform your thinking toward that other individual. If they're sitting beside you right now, just go ahead and stare at them. It's, it's, really, it's, it's, it's really comfortable when you do that. <laughs> Some of you guys are so awkward, you actually did that. Uh, <laughs> let God, and, and that's, yeah, that's why you have problems. Uh, <laughs> secondly, let God's truth and love transform your talk to others. Let God's truth and love transform your, the way you talk to other people, even people you disagree with, even people that are on the you know, other end of the scale, spiritually, politically, you name it. We should never address anyone without speaking truthfully and covering it up in love. And then let it transform his love, his truth. Let it transform your touch upon others, the way your life reaches out to other people. The neighbor, the coworker, uh, the member here at church, um, the person down the street, the, the barista, the person that works at, at the store, the way your life <coughs> touches other people. Let it be the touch of truth, of God's truth, the touch of love, God's love impacting that individual this day. And then one final thing, it's not on, I didn't plan this to be on the notes, um, and I don't have it on ProPresenter today. But actually, Pastor Paul was talking to me about this before the service, and I thought, that is so good, I'm gonna add it into the message at the end. And don't forget to take in God's truth and God's love for yourself. Don't forget, guys, to take in, breathe it in spiritually, God's love and God's truth for you. God is true. God is true to you. He is ever faithful. He will never desert you. He will never say, enough's enough, you're out of my life. No, he is true to you always, and if you will but listen, you will hear God speak to you over and over and over again how faithful he is and wants to be forever to you. He's tired of me, Lord? <laughs> no way, he says. No way. And then drink in his love. Drink in his love. It's there. Some of us get sidetracked by seeing all the things that are going wrong, seeing all the things that are difficult, but do you not understand that even in the things that are wrong and even in the things that are difficult, that Jesus Christ, who could bail on you, didn't and isn't and never will. Jesus is with you guys. He's with me. He wants to spend time with us, always will give us everything he's got everything he's got, no matter what we're going through. And that's his love. And I would dare say that your emotional health as well as your spiritual health will find healing and restoration the more you drink in for yourself the truth of God and the love of God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study it this morning. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will do a work in the lives of all of us who are here uh, on campus as well as online. And that your spirit, as we go through 2 John, will root out of us any of the world's thinking, the falsehoods that so many of us believe about truth and love. And Lord, as we go through this little series for the summer, Postcards from Paradise, I pray, Lord, that we'll learn more about your truth, 
more about your love for ourselves, and then, Father, that your Holy Spirit will free us up to gladly and happily and with humble confidence share, share your truth and your love with everyone around us. And so, my friends, with your eyes closed, with your heads bowed, I want to invite you, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, to be your God, to be your Savior. Man, you need to do that. Well, what's that about? It just says you admit to Jesus, you've blown it, you're a sinner like everybody else, and, and that you need forgiveness for your, your sin, and that you want to live forever with him in heaven, and you want to follow Jesus today. You pray that prayer, and you give your life to Christ. Man, you're born again. And I want to encourage you, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord, that you do so right now. Right now. Come to faith in Christ. And then for the rest of us who are believers, well, you have faith in Christ. And so this is a day for us to grow in faithfulness to Christ. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, because I sense it in my heart and I see it in your eyes, that this is a day, this is a pivotal day for many in our congregation. And you know that God has spoken to you this morning and he says, be faithful to me. Be faithful. And walk in my truth. And walk in my love. And do not turn to the right nor to the left and do not look back, but move forward with me. And he's grabbing your hand and he's saying, let's walk together in truth and in love and let's spread it to everyone we know. Father, take your scripture, take your word, all the things we've studied this morning and make this more than a study, dear Lord. Make this, I pray, the way we live. And we will give you the glory and the praise. Bring your healing into our own lives as we drink in your truth and love. And then help us, Father, to share that good medicine with everyone else around us. We pray in your name, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, God bless you guys. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we've got some folks right over here in the corner that would love to talk with you if you need more information about what it means to follow Jesus or maybe you got a prayer request or maybe you want to talk to them about how you can become more faithful in your walk with the Lord. They're right there for you. They've got some stuff they'd love to pray for you. Thank you. Greet one another. Enjoy your week walking in truth and in